Hi guys and welcome back to the Academy of Historical Fencing. The last sparring video I posted up was about the Dussac and specifically the Dussac versus the Rapier. Now the sword I used for that test, uh, or sparring footage, was this sword here. Um, and it's an interesting video and I want to talk a little bit more about the Dussac generally. Now this one, as I've said in the video, um, was kind of a throw together. It's actually made of four different swords um, thrown together to represent something as close to a Dussac as I could possibly do without actually buying one. And I would like to buy one, but it was just a throw together to actually put the, um, the idea into practice. So I'm going to talk about what the Dussac is and um, how it sort of relates to what we do in, in historical fencing. Um, first of all, the term um, Dussac can refer to a couple of different things. Um, if you look at, for example, some historical fencing treaties like Maya from uh, 1570, which is a very, very popular manuscript, he teaches an awful lot of weapons, we use it for longsword, uh, among other things. Now, in there he'll show a training de sac that is generally described as being made of wood, and there is a mention to leather, or perhaps leather cover, but largely wood, um, and it looks basically just like a short blade about this long, with um, uh, the guard, if you like, that, uh, like a D guard that wraps around the... Uh, the hands for a bit of protection. Now that was a very, very common training tool um, of the time period, and more than just a training tool, it was a sportive weapon. And much in the way that things like small sword and court sword developed into foil and epee, um, so did the dussac develop into a sport in itself. So um, you can see the term dussac being used for quite a few different things. The other thing that dussac was used for is this, which is a, if you like, basket hilted sabre of the very late 16th and early 17th century. Um, so we use the term for both. Uh, if you look at how the term was used historically, the term Dussac, Dussag, or Tessac um, is used interchangeably for the same sorts of weapons, although that can change a little bit depending on the time period you're looking at and training sword versus a sword being used in combat. So if you look back to the origins of it, um, it's largely believed to be uh, coming from Turkey, um, some of the curved blades there, and yes, that actually resembles the, um, the trin de sac that you see in Maya. It basically would be a sharp steel version of the exact same thing. And there are a, a, a few, a, a very few, but uh, the odd sort of surviving example that people have found historically. So we do have um, surviving examples, although very, very few of those. Um, and going on to what this sword is here, um, this is the sword that in the UK we commonly call a Sinclair hilt, um, and that's a very, very uh, modern term, um, largely, and it's to do with um, Scottish mercenaries uh, that were fighting in the early 17th century, and it was sort of named after the guy leading them. Um, so it, it, it was in use way before he used them, so it doesn't really mean an awful lot, but if you look at a lot of books that are about sword collecting or sword history, you're going to see the term Sinclair hilt come up an awful lot. And that is this kind of leaf-shaped um, hilt with a sweeping quillen, um, that's thumb ring, the, this kind of uh, broad flattened pommel, and a cur heavily curved blade. So um, yeah, this is exactly what you'd call a Sinclair hilt. But the term we don't really use an awful lot because it isn't particularly helpful. Um, so yeah, we usually refer to this as a Dussac or a Tessac. You can call it whichever you like. My understanding is that the term comes from the Czech language and means something like uh, claw or fang, but um, if you know more about that language then uh, feel free to add some information on that. Uh, in many the same way that uh, the Swiss sabres, which you see are in many ways a related sword, sometimes one-handed and sometimes two-handed, uh, were called something like um, uh, something related to a bird's beak, and again you can see it's, it's because of the shape of the blade. As you've got this big curved blade, it looks like a fang or a beak or something like that, so you'll see those kind of terms coming into play as well. Um, so, uh, going back a little bit um, to the early days, in uh, treaties sort of well before Maya, you'll see things like this being used, which this is a training sword, just aluminium, um, but this is what we call a, a Grossmesse or a Langsmesse, a big knife or long knife, and it is a, if you like, a short sword that is built like a knife. And by that I mean the guard, or the sorry, the grip, is pinned onto the tang rather than a pommel attached and the tang being pinned on top of the pommel. So it's constructed like a knife, not constructed like a sword. And that is why you get the distinction between um, the mezzer, uh, the Grosse Mezzer or Lang's Mezzer, and the falchion. Is the falchion is built like a sword, typically anyway. Um, so you'll see a lot of traditional falchions 
looking like an average arming sword that has a cross guard and a wheel pommel or something like that, and then a blade that looks like this, which could be straight or it could be curved. Um, so you can see this is very much um, the German version of the um, English falchion, and sometimes the grips can be one-handed, sometimes they can be one and a half or two-handed, there's quite a variety, but this is somewhere resembling typical proportions. Um, when you get fencing treaties through the 15th and 16th century, you'll see a mix going from Meza up towards Dussac. Sometimes the term is used interchangeably, and I think you'll find that's because as the weapons just evolved over time, they just moved from one to the other. And I think largely the systems moved from one to the other as well. Um, so you do just see the Dussac replacing the Meza um, in the treaties. So I think they were treated as um, very much a similar kind of weapon. The Meza typically had um, a small bit of protection on the side. This would be the later type with a, a side ring. More common would just be a nagel or nail, which would just be a small protruding bar from the side of the guard, but doing much the same thing as that. Uh, so that's that's the Meza. Uh, going on to um, the actual steel, basically a, a steel sharp Dussac or Tessac, this kind of sword came into practice. I mean, this exact type um, came into use somewhere around about 1560 or 1570. Um, people still argue all the time about when different Basque hilts came in, but certainly it's been proven over the last sort of 20, 30 years that they were in a lot earlier than people initially believed. And if you look at, for example, the sword that was found under the Mary Rose, that was quite a developed Basque hilt, and that's in the middle of the 16th century. So this kind of hilt could go back to possibly 1540, uh, 1550. Uh, this one is likely to be around about 1570 or 1580, perhaps going up as far as 1600. And um, that time period is when you see this type of sword being used really, really commonly. Uh, one of the most common uh, and famous usages was in uh, Norway, where they um, had to, every farmer had to actually buy and own his own sword. And they were bought from the state, whether new or second hand, um, sourced from Germany, which is where this sword was commonly made and um, they were bought in their hundreds and even thousands to the level that um, it's estimated by some people that as many as one in ten uh, sort of farmers and, or men in Norway would have owned a sword exactly like this. So I talked about the difference between training Dussac and a te Dussac or Tessac that is for combat like this and what actually defines that sword? <clears throat> well you always have to be a bit careful about getting hung up too much on definitions because historically you didn't tend to find as strict a definition for a weapon as that we want to try and put on it today. And that's because when we look at weapons today in, say, a museum, we want to compare hundreds or thousands of years of uh, sword history and sword culture against one another, and it's difficult to actually do so without some kind of reasonably strict definitions on what we're looking at. So, yeah, don't get too hung up on it, on it. but um, if you look at typical characteristics, they usually are a fairly short blade for a one-handed sword. Um, this one is uh, 80 centimeters, um, which is about 31 inches. Um, and you tend to find they're roughly in that range. There are quite a few that are a good bit shorter and there are some that are a little bit longer. Although for the uh, curved blades, this is about common. Um, and they weren't always curved either. They were straight examples. And the straight examples tend to be quite a bit longer and yet they're identical on the hilt. So, um, yeah, they're not always a sabre, sometimes they're straight, um, and the straight blades are sometimes single-edged and sometimes double-edged. But by far the most common version is the curved single-edged, um, as you see here. Um, going on to the hilt, uh, this type of um, a sort of almost an S-shaped, or shallow S-shaped quillen is uh, very, very common, and the leaf-shaped guard is characteristic of this type of weapon, although there are plenty of examples that don't have it as well. Some look more like you might expect to say an English basket hilt with just bars joining together. Um, so there's quite a bit of variety there. They, every single one I've ever seen has a um, thumb ring here. This is really, really common on uh, European basket hilt type swords. Um, whether you're talking about a Sinclair hilt, a more typical basket hilt like you think of um, the English and the Scots using, um, or um, uh, Skibonas, um, all kinds of cavalry swords and Walloon swords. Uh, so an immense amount of both um, infantry and cavalry swords in Europe around the sort of uh, 16th and 17th century and even going into the 18th as well. So the thumb ring is really common. 
Uh, you'll also see it, of course, on lots of Polish sabers. Uh, you tend to see it on heavy cutting swords, when the blades get rather substantial for the type of sword they are, and it does provide a nice bit of leverage um, on the um, um, for the hand in many of the same ways that um, wrapping the index finger over a side sword or a rapier does. It's just a different strategy for a more cutting based sword. But yeah, it's really, really common. I think every single Dussac I've ever seen has a thumb ring on it. Um, and then going on to the uh, hand protection, it's quite common to cover the major majority of the hand um, in terms of protection. And if you look at the amount of protection that this affords, it's roughly equivalent to what in Britain we would consider a mortuary hilt, that level of protection. So it's not a full basket, but it's a half or three quarter basket, so it has a lot of protection. And of course also having quillens, um, which early basket hilt swords tended to. You only see these disappearing from basket hilt swords in um, around about 1600 and uh, going into about 1610, 1620, and they, they start removing them because they find that with a big, big basket they're no longer particularly necessary, but um, they're kept uh, often out of fashion more than anything else. Uh, so that's the kind of rough characteristics of the sword. As I said, 80 centimeter blade, total weight of 1.15 kilos. Um, that means it's a little bit lighter than your average, say, English or Scottish basket sword, but that's not surprising because it is a little bit shorter as well. You'd expect uh, an English or Scots basket hilt to be um, usually in the range of 33 to 35 inch blade, so um, as opposed to the 31 that this is. So. It's about in line with, um, typical, proportionally in line with a lot of basket hilts. It's not an especially heavy sword, even though it looks very robust and very substantial. It's still remarkably agile for its uh, shape, size and weight. So um, who used them? Well, this is not a weapon of finesse. This is a weapon of war. That's not to say that they wouldn't have been carried in civilian life for civilian self-defense. In fact, most swords throughout most time periods were carried for that purpose when they were common. So the chances are you would have seen them in civilian life as well. But the most common use for this was as a um, infantry sword and quite possibly the longer versions for cavalry use as well. But um, most commonly an infantry sidearm. Uh, what does it really compare to in other things that we see um, from around Europe? Well, the one thing that the, um, this does look like, if you like, is a pirate sword. Uh, that's not really any surprise because it is essentially a cutlass or sabre depending on how long it is. But um, at this length it's kind of in between cutlass and sabre, it's, it's the intermediate line. So yeah, you will see lots of pirate movies with similar swords to this. And yes, they were used on ships as well. So it's a, a generic infantry short sword as a general rule. Um, it's nothing expensive, it's mass produced, it's what we would call munitions grade. And you will find some prettier and more delicate examples with more detailing, but most of them are like this. They are quite simplistic um, and really just about a good battlefield weapon. So um, that's just a sort of overview of the sword. Uh, this one is, by the way, still quite sharp and uh, it is an original. Bear in mind it's over 400 years old now. Um, so that's a sort of an overview of the sword. Um, tracing its sort of heritage. As I said, you've got the, the Meza and you've got the influence of the Turks, I think, were probably the most likely influence on, um, on the sort of the use of the sabre at the time. Um, and what you could classify the Dusak is, is a, if you like, either a Meza or a Turkish sabre blade with a European basket or side sword um, hilt. And that's exactly what defines the the actual steel Dussac or, or Tessac. Um, what did it become over time? Because sword types don't generally just disappear, they usually evolve into something if they're particularly good at what they do. And to bring back one of my personal favourites, the British 1803 uh, Infantry Officer's Sword, I bring this up all the time. Why? Because it's one of my favourite swords of all time, let alone one of my favourite sabres, it's one of my favourite just designs of all time. It's incredibly effective, incredibly agile, um, a very powerful cutter and still very fast, offering a reasonable amount of hand protection. Um, and how does it really compare to the um, Dussac? Uh, well, it's exactly the same blade length, that 80 centimeter blade. The curvature is not so different and historically you will find a variation on curvature for both of these swords. So you could find them um, being very, very similar indeed. How does the weight vary? Well, 
The Sabre is 810 grams to the Dussac's 1.15 kilos. That's hardly surprising. It's not the blade that really does it. There might be a little bit more mass um, in the blade. It's a little bit broader towards the tip. But the main thing, of course, is that uh, big quillen and basket protection. So you're talking about a sword that is not so drastically different to this. Um, and this was around about 1580 to 1600. And this is um, an 1803 pattern from around about 1805. So you're talking about swords you know, just over 200 years apart. And how are they particularly different? Well, not much at all. Uh, this has got a bit more hand protection and this is a little bit lighter because it doesn't have that hand protection. And of course, when this was in use, the Scots were using basket hilts offering as much protection as this. Which um, takes me on to something else, is that when the Scots were using basket hilted swords, uh, which is something like, uh, like this, this is actually an English style, but roughly resembles the kind of protection that a Scottish basket hilt would have, they did also put sabre blades on their basket hilts and end up with a sword exactly like this. And um, they called that, and I've no idea how you're actually supposed to pronounce it, but it's something like um, Turkale, um, which um, comes from obviously some kind of Turkish blade type thing, and they reference quite a lot in Scottish history. So by far from being as common as a straight blade, they weren't, but they were very well known. So um, there were clearly quite a few around, and there are a number in museums still, some really nice examples. And they tend to resemble a Scottish basket hilt with a 1796 light cavalry or 1803 type blade on them. And it's the exact sort of hybrid. So that's also the Scottish sword that was being used um, to a fair degree at that time as well. Going on to what I made here, I made this because it therefore roughly resembles the Dussac, that original that I was showing you. It's the same length, the curvature isn't too far off, and the hand protection is roughly similar, despite the fact that it doesn't have a quillen and it doesn't have a thumb ring. But overall, represented the um, that sword quite well. It's the same weight, it's roughly the same handling. So that actually gave a sort of reasonably realistic interpretation of the sword. Um, so going back to the Dussac, it's actually one of the things you're going to see very, very rarely in the HEMA world. Um, you'll almost never see this kind of sword being used for any kind of training purpose. Is that the Dussac has pretty much become the wooden or leather, sometimes also um, plastic, um, training sword. And often they are thrashed about as if they're machetes. And I think that's a bit of a shame. Much like the uh, Langus or Grossmesser, most original examples weren't particularly light. So um, it depends what you want to represent. If you want to do very much a sportive approach of the actual sport of Dussac fencing, then that's fine. You can use something light, it's sportive, absolutely fine. But if you're training or using something like this, the Dussac or Tessac, which is a weapon of war, um, you really want to be using something a little bit more representative. Now, some people would ask, um, ask to actually change the ter terminology, to not call this a Dussac, but Dussac and Tessac do mean the same thing. Um, why in the treaties do you not see a sword that exactly looks like this? Well, also, look at, say, Maya, for example. One of the really common swords around Maya's time were long swords with hugely developed what we call compound or complex hilts, the kind of hilts that you would see on a rapier, but on a long sword. And you don't see those in the treaties either. And I think you'll find that's very simple, is that the training swords that are being used are simple, cheap, and easy to manufacture, and you shouldn't largely be changing your technique from one to the other. So often when you see treaties that do have big guards, like say Roas Manual, says do not parry with the guard. It's a benefit once you're in the fight, but you don't specifically aim to parry with it. So therefore, you could use a open-hilted sword to train for this. Um, of course, we're never going to get into combat with swords like this, because we're not training to actually fight with them for, for real anymore. And therefore, we actually want to get some sparring bats in that are a little bit more realistic and representative of a real fight than um, just an actual practice session would sort of be historically using, say, wooden trainers. So there you have it. There's the um, Dussac or Tessac. Um, it's a really solid, really robust, very sort of uh, universally good infantry sword um, that was popular for quite some time certainly for um, around about the mid 16th up to the mid 17th century and I think from what I've seen they did last um, a good bit longer in um, in other parts particularly in Norway um, and of course derivatives of them that you see um, like the military sabre which look very much like it 
and the Scottish basket hilt with the um, with the saber blade, the turquoise, uh, carried on for hundreds of years beyond this sword. So you could justifiably call this a basket hilt saber or basket hilt cutlass, or just a cutlass. So there you go, the Dosago Tessac, a really nice weapon. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.